doing. We're pleased today to have Josie Walker with us. She's a native of Eastern North Carolina. She has a passion for agriculture, self-sufficiency, and connecting people, despite having cultivated a very eclectic adult life, mostly as a teacher in subjects ranging from mathematics and English as a foreign language to arts and crafts. That's really quite a lot. In 2003, she earned a degree in mathematics from UNC Charlotte and another in urban and community horticulture from North Carolina Agriculture, Agricultural and Technical State University in 2016. While at NCANT, Josie served as the local food ambassador, an NC 10% campaign program for college students to promote local food and sustainability on their individual campuses. And she was named a 2016 local food hero by Farm to Fork. She has also worked as the Farm Research and Outlet Commute Outreach Co Coordinator for U Foods, which is a two-year project designed to develop new market opportunities for farmers by building collaborative supply chain links from farms to university campuses in North Carolina. Josie believes strongly that people should be able to have access to fresh, healthy food. Growing it themselves should be a right and not a privilege. She also believes that God has given us stewardship over the land, and it's up to us to create sustainable spaces to grow food and act as wildlife habitats while building community and good soil. And with that, I'd like to say, Josie, so glad you're with us today. Thank you for having me. And All right. So, as you said, my name is Josie Walker, and I'll be talking today about expanding the role of agriculture. So, thank you, Sherry, for the introduction, but a little bit more about me. Um, currently, I'm working with Together We Compost out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm an advisory board member for the North Carolina Community Garden Partners. Um, a year ago, a friend and I started the Black Seed Saving Collective, and I am also a member of the North Carolina Native Plant Society of the Central Coastal Plains. So how did I get here? How did I go from being a math teacher, an English teacher, to caring about agriculture and feeding people? So until about 2009, um, I was just not really sure what I was doing with myself. Um, but in fifth grade, I distinctly remember having the thought that I wanted to have my own farm and be completely self-sufficient, even though at 10 years old, I'm not exactly sure what I thought that meant. But I, I knew I wanted to do that, but I had no real connection to agriculture, even though both of my parents grew up on small subsistence farms, also in Eastern North Carolina. So um, in 2009, I ended my one year teaching, te uh, high school math teaching uh, stint and went to grad school at Winston-Salem State University. I decided to change everything and go into linguistics. Um, I still love linguistics, but grad school was definitely not for me. And once I finally made the decision, you know what, this, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, someone in my cohort said, hey, they're starting a community garden at the university. And that was the beginning of all of this. Um, I joined the community garden. I realized that this is where I wanted to be, somewhere with my hands in soil, growing things around people. Um, and I kept going out there for free. So I figured if I'm doing this for free, I should probably be doing this 
for work. So um, while I was uh, a member of the community garden, uh, North Carolina a and started a program called Urban and Community Horticulture. And I went to the information night. It was exactly everything that I had thought about, uh, what I wanted to do, what I wanted, where I wanted to be. So I uh, applied, got in. Um, and because I already had a degree, I, it only took me two and a half years to complete the coursework. So I wasn't there long enough to do more, unfortunately. But one of those years I've spent as a local food ambassador for the NC 10% campaign. So I uh, started a, an informal club called Sustainable Ag at a t to try to get more people uh, to see the possibilities within agriculture and not just what we were being taught in school and not just what we had come to believe was available to us. Um, and because of my stint at, as a local food ambassador, um, I got offered a job to work on a pro the U Foods, which stands for University Food Systems, uh, for the U Foods uh, project. And so I went out to find, find farmers local to each of the campuses that have local food ambassadors so that the students and faculty and staff could have access to, to local food. Because most people thought, oh, local food, you know, that's just for rich, rich people. That's not for us. And there are farmers who are local to, you know, quote unquote, underserved uh, communities who are just looking for markets. They, they're looking for people to sell to and connecting the people on campus to the farmers was something that I actually had a lot of fun doing, which I, which sounds a little weird, but it was, it, I enjoyed it a great deal. Um, and so after my uh, contract was up with U Foods, I started North Carolina Council of Churches. Um, they have a, they have a program called Partners in Health and Wholeness, and they work with uh, churches so that they can uh, have work on programs with uh, healthy eating, active living, mental health, and tobacco, tobacco secession. And I was drawn in for the healthy eating, community garden, church growing uh, aspect of it. And uh, it turns out people have a lot more uh, ambitions about growing food than they do about actually growing food, which is, you know, a good place to start. And um, after that, I was with Faithlands. I was the, uh, East, the Faithlands coordinator for Eastern North Carolina. And we were trying to uh, get congregations with land to either lease, rent, or donate that land to local farmers um, so that the farmers have access to land to grow, either to sell or to donate. Um, and churches have a lot of fallow land. The most thing that they grow is grass and the grass is no good unless you're a goat. Um, so the trouble with growing, growing on uh, land for communities of faith, unfortunately, is that a lot of times the people in the congregation don't understand that Farming and gardening does not have to look like, you know, doesn't have to be tractors. It doesn't have to be uh, tilled, you know, tilled rows that are perfect, you know, perfectly straight and extra long and take up the whole uh, parking lot or the whole church ground. Um, so changing people's minds to see the possibility of what they could do with the land that they already have. Uh, is a lot more difficult than we had anticipated. Um, and after that, I went to the North Carolina, the, sorry, not North Carolina, the uh, Black Church Food Security work where I was North Carolina uh, field organizer. And the mission is similar to Faithlands, with, except specifically targeting Black churches. Um, and not only for the churches to use their land to grow food or the congregation to grow food or to have local farmers and gardeners grow food, 
but also to um, create a space for a farmer's market if one didn't already exist in the neighborhood. And that um, is not only a place to have make local food available, but it's also a place for economic opportunities for entrepreneurs in the community. So that's, a, sorry, that's a lot. And I usually don't like talking about myself that much, but I figured you'd need to know how, how, do, how did I even get to care about any of this stuff. So um, now, as I said before, I'm uh, on the advisory board for the North Carolina Community Garden Partners. Um, we're trying to build a, a tighter network of community gardens across the state, share information, and to also um, build community because a lot of community gardens don't have that connection to other to other gardens, so that they could learn about what to do differently or what 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 the possibilities are. Um, we started the Black Seed Saving Collective because originally my partner, uh, Lashana Austria, she and I were trying to come up with ideas like what can we do for North Carolina people. Uh, we've been to different conferences and we know what young people are looking for. We know what the older folks are looking for. Like how can we bring everybody together? And so we finally settled on a seed saving collective and our idea is very simple um you get a small group of people who are local to you and local is you know relative depending on where you are and we grow uh we grow out our plants to seed and then we share it within our group and you know we hope to eventually grow big enough that we can share across groups and across the state um because lo uh, locally adapted seeds especially in North Carolina are somewhat difficult to come by and culturally appropriate seeds and his, uh, historically appropriate, se uh, appropriate seeds are also uh, difficult to find. And now I'm just trying to figure out what's next. What, what's my next move in the world of agriculture? And then I've, I've got a list of some things that just generally interest me, you know, teaching people how to grow their own food, how to sell their own food, how to create markets to uh, make the, make their food and also other products available to each other. Um, because we, there is a way that we can create, create a space for us to uh, share our goods and services that don't necessarily have to follow the, the, the traditional rules. Um, I also enjoy, uh, enjoy and uh, look for opportunities to advocate for uh, regional supply chains and uh, regional food systems and teaching people about the importance of seeds, seed saving. And especially since uh, the pandemic has hit us, we know that seeds aren't always available and the seeds that you want are not always available. So it's up to you to make those make those decisions yourself so that if you if you want a specific variety of watermelon seed it's best that you save those seeds for the future okay so why aren't more people interested in gardening um why you know why don't you have more young people in garden clubs why do you why why aren't people clamoring to to join you and one of then this is a picture of a greenhouse. Uh, it's actually uh, a pecan uh, growing experiment in order to inoculate them with truffles. This is one of the projects that I undertook while I was in uh, school at North Carolina A&T. And the precision and, and specificity of what I had to do was a huge turnoff. The, in, the good thing about this project was I learned that I cared more about growing the pecan trees than I did about the truffles or mushrooms at all. But the everything having to be exactly right was a huge deterrent for me. And that is also a deterrent for other people 
um, where the where gardens exist or where people think of where gardens exist, that keeps potential enthusiasts out. If you, if you have a beautiful garden at your house, I mean, that automatically keeps, uh, keeps other people ha- out because that's your house. Nobody's going to come into your space to look at your garden unless you invite them. Um, or even at botanical gardens, you know, they are open to the public, but do, do people feel welcome to enter? Is that a place that, you know, the average person on the street will feel like, oh, this is for me that I can go in there, and that's one of the that's one of the things that keeps people people away. And that does that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not interested. They just might be intimidated to uh, to explore more. And also, what's in your garden? Um, you know. I've heard this a lot, especially with uh, people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s. They refused to have a garden because they had one growing up. It was too much work and they just don't want to be bothered. But they do appreciate the good food and the, and the connection to the earth. So how do you how do you get them out of the out of the mindset that it has to be hard or it has to be difficult? Um, also, you know, ornamental gardens they give the impression that everything has to be perfect and that they're just for look just for looking. You just you know look but don't touch, which is not a terrible thing. But not everybody has the luxury to have plants that take up space that are just there to be looked at, that don't seemingly have another purpose, even though we all know that they do have another purpose. But on the the quote unquote practical side, it just seems like they're just decorations. So how do we get people out of the mindset? Use your imagination. You have to think what could be, what what's what's possible versus, you know, what has always been and what should be. The only thing that's keeping things the way they are is you. If you have ideas of how to do things differently, try it. If it doesn't work, oh well, now you know. But if you don't try, you don't you'll never know. And also just because you've always done it doesn't mean that you need to keep doing it or that it was a good thing to do to begin with. So try to stay open about what, what can be. So this is a, a, a picture from a, a, a program called adopt a Pie. One of my professors at A&T started it for as, as a sort of like a community garden for faculty and staff, because at this particular time, I was working in the greenhouse, I got a pot, even though I wasn't faculty or staff. But um, there's a, a brick retaining wall on the edge of the property of the greenhouse, and they set up a bunch of grow pots, the grow bags. And the plants are grown uh, by the workers in the greenhouse. And then you invite everybody out and they adopt the pot. You fill it up, they put, they pick out which plants they want, they arrange them however they want to. And they don't have to take care of their plants if they don't, if, unless they choose to. That's up to the, um, the greenhouse staff. But, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's, a good, it's a good pro. It was a good program because it got people out. It got them out of the building, and it gave you an opportunity to grow something that belonged to you. That you know you could have your own mustard greens. You could have your own kale without having you know without actually having a plot of land or a a, a place to 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 grow that you already had access to. Um, and one of the professors was really into it. And he, uh, 
he actually did harvest, he harvested his uh, pot quite often. And he was actually looking forward to it every season uh, to supplement his uh, groceries. Um, this is something that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's a simple project, but I had never actually done it. Um, while I was with the Black Church Food Security Network, uh, COVID started right when our uh, work started. So we had to completely pivot and come up with something new and different to do. And one of the things that we came up with was to have gardening classes. And we had the gardening classes online, on Zoom, on Saturday morning at 9.30. And we had a consistent group who would come every Saturday and listen to what we had to say. And they started growing things at their own house. And the goal was to teach new, uh, new gardeners how to grow. But also, we were hoping that they, it would build their enthusiasm so that when things did get back to somewhat normal where people would go to uh back to church or back to or, or at least be back together outside they would uh be you know uh supercharged to get back to uh try to start growing for their communities on the church land so this is uh some lettuce that i regrew and celery and, um, and the reason that I'm so proud of it is because I had never tried it before. I'd read about it a bunch of times. I'd seen it for years, but I actually tried it and it worked. Um, and I was also proud of myself for uh, setting up the cameras so that I could demonstrate it and do it at the same time in, uh, in order for everybody to see it. So. So how can we attract people to agriculture? So this farm in Jacksonville, North Carolina, um, I worked with this farmer a little bit earlier this year, somewhat last year. And this is uh, part of his peach orchard. And this year was his first year with peaches. And he told me that, you know, I really want to get the community more involved. I want them to, you know, be more engaged with my farm. So we set up um, a peach picking excursion, get people come out and pick peaches. And we were going to have this, try to get as many young people as possible to come out and, you know, do the Instagram thing and, or TikTok and take pictures and, and uh, make it, well, basically make it look cool because I've never actually been peach picking before. So I was just excited to go pick peaches uh, from somewhere local, but the idea that you could, you know, just that little, you know, have people out here to take pictures and be, you know, be out in, in, in an orchard was enough to get, uh, to generate some interest. Unfortunately, when it came time to uh, go out there and pick peaches, the bottom had fallen out and it was raining like crazy. So, no pictures got taken. So hopefully next uh, summer we'll try again and have more uh, more opportunities to get more of the community involved and uh, more young people uh, engaged in interacting with where their food comes from. Um, so how, you know, how can your garden club, how can you personally uh, do something to get more people involved in what your club is doing. And this list was taken directly from the National Garden Club's uh, site. Um, and I read the, read the ideas for National Garden Week and they, they're not bad ideas, but what are some new things you can try next year? Because um, looking at the list, there were a couple thing that I would suggest that you might want to change just even if you decide that you know what this list is great we're going to keep it but there's some wording you should definitely consider uh, making some changes to um, for example 
uh, beautify a managed, a manageable blighted area. What makes an area blighted? Whose idea, whose idea is it to call it blighted? And does that, does using that term kind of uh, sway how you, how you view the area and the people who live there? Um, maybe, like I said, think, think about how you word things. That, that does make a difference. Um, another, another idea, um, says plan an activity with a youth group or school students. That's actually a great idea, but the activity, um, maybe talk to this, the young people first and find out what are they into and then figure out how can you integrate that into what you already do or what interests you as a group or you as a person. Um, because taking activities to a group can you know, be hit or miss, but it would help if it was something they were already slightly interested in or curious about. Um, so the, yeah, I made this list because I really want y'all to think about what, what, what have you done in the past and how successful has it been and what could you do differently to bring in a new or different group um and yes actually yesterday i read an article um and one of the main points was think about what could be and not what should be and that's the best way to come up with ideas and this is actually a picture of uh, hibiscus sabdarifa, uh, Thai roselle. And I never knew that you could grow this in, well, in America at all, because I guess I never really thought about it. I just assumed that you could only grow it in the tropics, but also that you could grow it in Eastern North Carolina. It grows really easily, it grows really well. And it doesn't actually have that many pests, which to me, was a great revelation because I learned that, oh, I could actually grow it myself, dry it myself and have my own red hibiscus, like the red zinger tea. Like I can make my own and I know what went in it. I know where it came from. So learning that, learning about a uh, plant that, you know, traditionally, or at least in my experience, traditionally associated with the Caribbean, um, learning more about how they use it and what, what that could mean for me and people around me. Um, so think about what could be and not what should be. Um, so these are some questions that I came up with that, you know, still think about how can bring more people into gardening, into agriculture. Because agriculture is uh, food, fiber, and fuel. So that means almost everything that we interact with on a daily basis has some attachment to agriculture. So we could bring people in in, the, in myriad ways, even if you are you know, just a garden club. Um, for example, so do you really need to have a lawn? Does it need to be turfed? We could, you know, put more native plants out, use uh, ground cover instead of uh, turf grass, because um, that could that would definitely catch people's attention that you didn't have grass or you had a lot less of it. Um, do you have any native or produce plants growing? Uh, native plants could bring people in because they're a lot less uh, maintenance than ornamentals that are uh, non-native uh, produce plants because they they would definitely stand out in the landscape. But also, you know, produce but they produce fruits and vegetables that that could bring people in, knowing oh wait I can grow my own food. Um, and that's not to say that people would grow all of their own food. But um, sometimes that's the easiest way to get people in, that they know that they can grow something on their own. Um, native plants can also uh, 
uh, bring in people who are interested in bugs, interested in soil. There's, a, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, just changing up the plants that you have could uh, attract more people. Do you have any fruit and nut trees? Um, again, the eating aspect is definitely uh, a way to bring people in. Um, a lot of times, like cities and gardens don't have fruit and nut trees because they're messy. But, you know, that could be a way to bring people in through gleaning, invite people in to, to collect all that stuff. So, you know, less mess for y'all to worry about. Um, do you share your love of plants with people outside your club? I mean, of course, even the club, because y'all all love plants together. But how do you, do you share your love of plants with people outside your club? How do you show them the enthusiasm and uh, passion that you have for plants? How do you show that to people who uh, don't already feel the same way you do? Um, when you have activities, do, um, are they for just for garden club people or, or do you have activities for people who aren't a member of your club or even garden related? And uh, who are your garden club partners? Do you have any partners that could potentially uh, help you reach people who aren't already plugged in? And these are, these are rhetorical, but also really, I want you to think about it because this could change how, how you uh, increase your membership or how you increase your visibility within your community. And ask questions before you try to uh, help anybody or offer any programs, ask questions because you never know what people are interested in or what they want until you ask them. You, can, you can't just give somebody something. It's like, here, I brought this for you. Even if they are gracious, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to jump on it the way that you would or the way you would expect them to because you're giving it to, you're giving them something they didn't ask for. And the easiest way to get participation is to give people what they ask for and not necessarily give them what you think they, they need. So, so, yeah, what do people actually want? Can you help them get what it is that they want? And it's not about what you would do or what you would want. You have to remember you're, you're there to help them. And you can use your influence to benefit them if you stick to what it is that they want. They want to do what their goals are, where they want to go. Um, and this is a picture of a gar the garden that I started at the church that I attended when I was in was at North Carolina a and um, the, the church got together and said, we want to have a garden. I mean, it's very small, but they said, we want to grow something here. We want to, you know, try to make some make things available to, you know, the community. So this was part of my senior seminar project was to build this and uh, put out the plans. Um, and it was, you know, it was about what they wanted and uh, how they wanted to do it. And I just had to use my best judgment to point them in the direction that they wanted to go. Um, in hindsight, of course, I, I realized a lot of mistakes that I made as a, an early horticulture student, but um, for the most part, I think, you know, I, I did a good job in following their lead versus what I personally would have wanted to do. So let your plants and gardening show you, you your enthusiasm will be the magnet. That's what will draw the people in. Um, 
and tell your story. So tell, when I say tell your story, I mean, tell what, what about plants? What about gardening? What about garden club? What about any of this is what gets you excited? What, how did, how did you get to be where you are on your horticultural, agricultural journey? Um, what are, what are the things that, you know, get, get your, that's, that spark your fire that, you know, oh, I, you know, I love talking about this. I love doing this, that because your enthusiasm will rub off on somebody else. They're going to see, oh, he or she is really into this. There might be something in it for me too. There might not be, but it could get that other person's wheels turning like, oh, well, Maybe there's something out there for me too to be excited about. Um, and simple ideas matter. If you come up with something and it seems like, oh, you know, this is this is not exciting. This isn't going to change the world. It doesn't matter. If you think it's a good idea, it's probably a good idea. Try it. Do it. Uh, Black Seed Saving Collective. It is a super simple idea, very, very simple. We got it off the internet and we thought, you know, okay, this will work. And it, it really blows people's minds when they, when they find out that there's not really a whole lot to what we're trying to do. And what we're trying to do is to teach people how to save seeds, how to, and to share them with other people. There's, there's not a whole lot of extra work you don't, uh, it's not like you're trying to grow seed for a seed company or you're trying to grow enough seed for a seed bank. You're growing enough for you and for other people. And then you share it. And then those seeds are grown by the other pe by the people in your seed sharing circles, which is what we call them. They do the same thing. And slowly but surely, those seeds get out to more people without any extra work because you're growing things that you would have eaten anyway or things that you uh, enjoy growing just so. And the thing that I'm most proud of, of with Sustainable Ag was just getting the word out about all the possibilities within agriculture 